My name is Jenny Salk, and I'll be moderating the uh, IBD portion of Melenkov. I hope you've been enjoying it so far. And I'd like to take a few minutes to introduce our panelists today. So we have a very nice, a wonderful group of panelists here. Um, so I'd like to extend a special thank you to our uh, visiting professors, uh, Dr. Guerrero and Dr. Cohen, from trekking out from colder places like Chicago and Cleveland to enjoy our, our weather for a day inside a conference room. <laughs> so anyway, I take a few minutes to introduce them. So uh, Dr. Miguel Ruggiero is the professor of medicine. He's the chair of the Digestive Diseases and Surgical Institute at Cleveland Clinic and um, a professor of medicine and um, of, of the uh, Learned College of of medicine at Case Western University as well. And we have Dr. Russell Cohen. He's a professor of medicine um, at Pritzker School of Medicine and is the director of the Inflammatory Bowel Diseases Center at University of Chicago. Um, next, we have Dr. Mary Kwan, and she's associate professor of surgery at UCLA. And we have Dr. Berkeley Limkid Kai, who is associate professor of medicine at UCLA and is a director of our IBD clinical research in our IBD center. Okay, so with that, I'd like to get started with Dr. Russell Cohen, and he's going to start off with giving us a talk about how we should be thinking about our uh, treatment paradigms in IBD. So he'll kind of um, start with the framework of our thinking of how we should be thinking about treating our patients. Great. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. I don't know if you want to clap until you hear my presentation, but thank you to everyone, the conference organizers, especially Jenny, who uh, uh, arranged me to come out here. And it's, it's nice to be out here live, and I know we have a, a virtual audience as well, too. This is the most important presentation you're going to hear all day, because all of us have not been doing it right. For years and years and years, we've been treating IBD almost retrospectively letting damage happen, and as long as a patient felt okay, I'm okay. You're okay, I'm okay. Slap on the back or in the GI world on the rump and get on out of here. But in reality, um, what we have known and now we have data to prove uh, is that we really should be treating to target. Please presume that in the course of today's lecture or uh, banter at the uh, coffee table or in the washroom that I probably have disclosures for any company that we're going to talk about. So what we're going to do is um, we're going to go through some uh, objectives, which I'm not going to read to you. Um, cheat to target. This is the idea. Um, patients with IBD um, often will have inflammation, and you're going to be in a position where you do a diagnostic test and assess the location and the severity of the inflammation and then you're going to pick a treatment. I'm sorry but we don't have a mouse up here to, 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 to point. Um, and if I point on the screen, the people in the video um, won't see it. But nevertheless, uh, the idea is, is that if you pick your treatment, you then do an objective test to prove it's working. And if it's not working, irregardless of how the patient feels, you got to up the game. you got to up the dose, add a different medicine, change therapies, and then you give time for it to work, and then you reassess again, objectively. Um, and you do that until you get the patients well, not just well how they feel, but well when you assess them uh, with objective measures. So um, symptoms, well, symptoms um, are still important because patients are really coming to you because of their quality of life, um, especially when you start getting them better. They want to get back to doing things, kind of like we want to get back to taking off masks. Um, laboratory values, we'll talk about CRP or fecal calprotectin, fecal lactoferrin um, as assessments. Mucosal healing, mucosal healing actually decreased hospitalizations and surgeries. Those are the biggest cost drivers in inflammatory bowel disease. And then um, what do we determine as uh, a true remission? Is it someone feels well? Is it that they look good when you heal them up endoscopically? What about microscopically? How about if we do what Miguel actually was very famous for, modifying the disease course? Because we know what Crohn's does, comes back after surgery. So if you prevent it from coming back after surgery, then you've obviously modified the disease course. So your outcomes need to be objective, reproducible, and obtainable. And I think that's important. The last thing, you go to lectures and people like me say, oh, do this, that. You're like, yeah, that's not real realistic. So there are objective measurements of disease. Endoscopically, um, there are a few different indices, the Crohn's disease endoscopic index of severity, the simple endoscopic score for Crohn's disease, and, and postoperatively, the Rutgers score. Does anybody in this audience, raise your hand, do any of you use 
the CDEIS, the CES CD, one person's raised their hand. The Rutgert score for post-op recurrence, few people. So virtually no one's raised their hand on any of these. That's because the Crohn's disease um, uh, assessments are actually very complicated. Counting the different segments, how much, what percentage of the area is inflamed, um, uh, what percentage is ulcerated, whether they're stricturing, it's very time consuming and we do it for clinical trials. And um, if you train any fellows or have any vet visitors from Europe or Japan, they do it religiously. <laughs> um, uh, the Rueckert scale is much simpler for post-operative occurrence and many of us use that to guide therapy. But in a way, many of us adapt what I'm gonna show you for the ulcerative colitis disease activity um, when we're doing endoscopy. Generally, um, the Mayo score, the, the, the subscore, the endoscopic subscore of the Mayo uh, index, and that's shown here. Generally, when, with ulcerative colitis, we say patients have mild disease. If you see in the picture there, there's granular mucosa. We always give the example of someone rubbed sandpaper against the, the beautiful um, arborization of the natural um, uh, vascular pattern. If there's edema, if there's loss of na uh, normal vascular pattern, the moderately severe Mayo patients, they actually have more coarse granularities, even small, small ulcerations, erosions, and friability, meaning that even just the scope passing by or rubbing it with a, 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 with a forcep without opening it bleeds, and then severe or deeper ulcerations and hemorrhage. So many of us have actually applied these same principles when we're looking at Crohn's, um, Crohn's disease patients too, presuming their disease is within the reach of a scope. The second thing is that you have to choose outcomes that reflect disease progression. So what if someone has an ulceration? If they say the same, you guys done this, you scope someone, you get into their ileum with Crohn's, and you know what? They have three to four centimeters of a few ulcerations, and they've had it for 15 years. Big deal. Their disease hasn't progressed. Well, there has been shown, though, that uh, mucosal healing uh, in Crohn's does lead to a decrease in hospitalizations and surgeries. So this graph on the left showed number of hospitalizations. Yellow is patients with no healing. This was um, uh, from uh, initially the ACCENT uh, trial in Crohn's disease, the ACCENT-1 trial. Red are patients who had mucosal healing at either week 10 or week 54. And then green shows those who are healed at 10 and 54. Look, there is no green. Because <laughs> patients who are healed by week 10 and week 54 had no hospitalizations and no surgeries. And patients who had healing at least one of those visits had far fewer hospitalizations and surgeries than those who didn't. So it actually matters. Mucosal healing matters in Crohn's. This actually was the famous um, top-down versus step-up treatment uh, done in Europe where patients got infliximab loading, but then um, just continued on um, azathioprine, 2.5 mg per kg, um, dosed uh, by levels, or they were given steroids, steroids, and steroids, and then just went down the azathioprine and infliximab track uh, in the yellow, the step up. As you can see, remission at one year was much better in the top down, but look on the right-hand side, complete endoscopic healing at two years out. Two years out, if you kicked off with infliximab, the patients were, uh, three quarters of the patients were healed. And then the other thing that's important is one of the things we really always push in Crohn's and colitis is steroid sparing. And um, in this study um, that Gert Danz and uh, Philippe Bert had um, contributed to, you can see that patients who have a simple endoscopic score of zero, zero means normal, uh, were 70% were remission off steroids in blue, and 62% were off steroids and, in fact, even got off the anti-TNF, while those who had active inflammation in red did not. So looking in, if, in the case of Crohn's even, an area endoscopically or even radiographically, if you need to, makes a difference. It also decreases um, major abdominal surgeries. You can see that patients on the right who have no mucosal healing in gray, that's the need for um, major abdominal surgery, the median of two years follow-up, while well, if you had partial or complete healing in the blue or the red, it was far lower. Uh, the EXTEND trial with adalimumab also again showed not only did mucosal healing predict multiple better outcomes shown here, but look at the very bottom, cost savings too, compared to patients who were only in clinical remission. 
So a lot of people say, oh, I don't want to use those medicines, they cost too much. Well, A, they didn't hire you to be their accountant, they hired you to be their physician, okay? So tax time's coming up, so if you want to do their taxes, you can. But you have, you have to use therapies that are effective, and they actually end up saving money. Here's uh, ulcerative colitis. Look at this, on the right, this is patients who relapse who just have clinical remission, how you feeling, versus on the left, patients who are not only clinically but also endoscopically in remission. A tremendous difference in relapsing, proving that they're healed up. Also, you have lower surgery, surgery rates. Patients who had, after one year, um, mucosal healing, on the left, their surgery was only 19%, but those who did not, um, 81%. Huge difference. And this is just a similar study. We're showing that early mucosal healings correlates with be better outcomes. Um, the top lines are an endoscopic uh, subscore of zero, and the, the lower lines are a subscore of three, and everything else is in between. Sorry, the box got messed up, but you can see patients, patients have lower surgery rates, better symptomatic control, and lower steroid rates. So there are certain biomarkers that you may have heard of. The most common ones are C-reactive protein and fecal calprotectin. Unfortunately, in Crohn's, there's been a very poor correlation between CRP and Crohn's disease activity index. So Crohn's disease uh, uh, activity index on the bottom and CRP on the left, you'd like to see a 45 degree diagonal line and you see a flat line. Turns out CRP is not very sensitive. Fecal calprotectin is better. I, not everyone makes CRP. So if you have someone who is inflamed and they make CRP and then they're feeling well and their CRP is normal, that's probably a good sign. But if their CRP is still up, they're either still inflamed or something else is going on. Fecal calprotectin, though, has much better sensitivity in area under the curve than CRP. In fact, uh, now, um, while the data that I, on the last slide showed fecal calprotectin was helpful even in small bowel Crohn's, Personally, I haven't found that to be the case. Um, uh, I think it's hit or miss with small bowel Crohn's. Um, sometimes you get people make a lot of CR, uh, fecal calprotectin, sorry, and other times you don't. And this shows the accuracy isn't as good as one would see in colitis. So it's important that we don't use biomarkers as standalone predictors. They're really part of the puzzle. In fact, I always say to my fellows, imagine the patient is like a jigsaw puzzle and you get some inflammation from your endoscopy or from maybe from small bowel imaging and Crohn's. You get some from histology. You get from, some from CRP or fecal calprotectin. You get some from how the patient feels. But so you can't always complete the puzzle with just one, one part of the um, evidence. It's the the um, fecal calpro and CRP are helpful when they're used together with clinical <clears throat> and endoscopic evaluations. This is shown in the COM trial. The COM trial was a patient a trial in Crohn's where patients were randomized um, to either clinical management um, based on um, Crohn's disease activity index and prednisone use on the top, or treat to target. Same parameters, but also fecal calprotection or CRP. So in other words, the patients who came in, if they felt fine on the purple ones, you didn't change their therapy increase the dose, move on to next therapy. The ones in red, if they felt fine, but they had elevated CRP or fecal calprotectin, you still increase their doses or moved on to the next therapy, even if they felt fine. And the therapies were um, no treatment, adalimumab every other week, adalimumab weekly, or then adalimumab plus azathioprine. And the difference, sorry, the colors have changed here, is that the patients with just clinical management were shown in blue, but those who you not only look clinically, but also had CRP or fecal calprotectin shown in green. And you can see the, on the left-hand side, that's the endoscopic, the Crohn's endoscopic findings were 45% or 46% versus 30%. And looking to the right side of the screen, you can see in all, almost all cases, the green bars are much higher than the blue bars. So adding CRP and fecal calprotectin to clinical um, outcomes and prednisone use is important. Radiographically, there's lots of ways of looking at the small bowel and different types of indices. Uh, there is an MRE scores for Crohn's disease. I'm not going to um, go through this uh, today's lecture. You should all have these in, in your slides. Um, it's not clear to me that many people use these outside of research. Again, not standalone predictors, but can add on to the others too. 
the stride um, recommendations from the International Organization for the Study of IBD um, went, went through, and actually this has helped us with clinical trials determine what should be the targets to treat. So you can see here the updated stride two. You have symptomatic response at the first circle, symptomatic remission and normalization of CRP, decrease in calprotectin, normal growth in children, endoscopic healing, normalization of quality of life and absence of disability. Those are your, your targets. You get through them one at a time. Uh, composite endpoints for Crohn's are patient-related outcomes and endoscopic remission, and ulcerative colitis is patient-related outcomes and endoscopic remission. So in summary, we treat to target. You define your disease-specific outcomes. They should be objective, reproducible, and obtainable. Choose the outcome that reflects disease progression and show that your interventions are achieving these incomes. That's probably the most important part of this whole lecture. Prove it. Prove what you have done is working. Stick the scope in, get this imaging, prove it's working. And if it's not working, even if the patient feels good, make adjustments to therapy and then prove again, usually four to six months later, that it's working. Thank you very much for your attention and I gave you 14 seconds back. Um, so how are you practically implementing treat to target in your practice, like practically? Well, uh, that's a great question. So. In Crohn's disease, again, thank you to some of the research that Miguel did and others too, um, what we do is after someone has Crohn's surgery and then a reanastomosis, we scope them, we put them on therapy, even if they choose no therapy, we scope them six months later, prove it's working. With ulcerative colitis or Crohn's interventions, we usually do an objective measurement, maybe fecal carprotectin three months out, but essentially we would then scope maybe six months out, MRE depends on their symptoms, um, six to 12 months out too. But it depends what you saw as where their disease was, how did you assess it, because you also you want to be able to compare it too. But don't just let people float there and disappear just because they feel good. You're very happy they feel good, but prove it's working. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Okay. So now we're gonna see how th these principles apply to cases. So we're going to start with a Crohn's disease case. And throughout this case, we're going to be asking the panelists for their input um, on the management, on, on the course of the patient's uh, care. So uh, at the end, we'll probably have some time for, for some questions. Thank you. This is a 49-year-old woman. She has a history of Crohn's ileitis that was diagnosed at age 19. And so when she presented, she had perforating and stricturing complications at the time and had a fistula that required an ileocecal resection, and she had a 17-centimeter uh, ileal re resection at the time. So she had ileal um, involvement uh, uh, with fistula as a source from, the, from there. So from 1992 until 2015, really didn't have much management. Um, so this is kind of the, the way therapy used to be. You know, the patient feels fine. Why do I have to go in? I got my surgery. I feel great. So she had her mesalamines uh, postoperatively, and then she would be given courses of metronidazole as needed when her inflammatory markers were elevated. She really had no changes in her symptoms except occasional constipation. She did have a colonoscopy in 2003, uh, at that time, she was noted to have a tight anastomotic stricture, but biopsies were otherwise normal, and there was no active inflammation seen at the anastomosis. She had a small bowel follow-through at that time as well that showed no evidence of active Crohn's. So this is back in 2005. So she's feeling okay. Everyone says, you're all right, no need to do anything. Then in 2014, she reestablishes care with GI, and she has no right lower quadrant pain. Overall, still feeling well. Um, daily bowel movements, but occasional sensation of incomplete evacuation. And she has formed stools, Bristol 3, 4, no extra intestinal manifestations. But she does take medications every day to try to help with constipation. And she still remains on her mesalamine, 4.8 grams a day. So on labs, she has a hemoglobin of 11.9. And she is microcytic. Her CRP is a little elevated at 1.4. Uh, she has an iron, she's iron deficient with an iron set that's low and ferritin that's also low. Her B12 and D are fine. She has a colonoscopy at the time, and it shows that kind of the same findings in 2003. Um, the colonic side of her anastomosis is normal. Um, the ileal side is narrowed and could not be traversed. So my question first to the panel is, we've just talked about our history uh, for the past 30 years or so, roughly. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about that management and how would you have managed that differently? Well, you know, so 
and she only just has a little narrowing on her anastomosis. And if she has nothing, if you look through and you don't have any ulcerations and her small bowel far through was, um, was normal, I don't know if any other management would have made much of a difference because she does, it doesn't sound like she has active inflammation. Um, and having narrowing at the anastomosis, I mean, that's, that in itself, I don't, I, I don't think you can uh, rate as a failure of treatment decisions. Yeah, so I guess when you see that, um, do you feel that we need to be doing more for somebody who, I mean, she has this stricture that's there. It's been there for, for now. It probably formed pretty quickly. Um, is there more that needs to be done with her management? Do we need to see what's going on? Yeah, so I'll, I'll chime in. I mean, I think this is an interesting case and, and just a couple relevant points that I think are important to point out. So in, in 1992, so she's had a long standing post-operative course on what you would consider fairly minimal therapy, and mesalamine has not been proved to be effective. So you could argue that's maybe not doing anything. However, she had a perforation initially, and, and when I get to my talk, I'll, I'll outline this. Most of the Crohn's that's penetrating in the ileum is also associated with a stricture. So it sounds like she had a stricture, you get high pressure above the stricture, there's a deep ulcer, and they get a sinus tract or a fistula. That's different than a patient who comes in with de novo penetrating disease and without a stricture. The reason I make that distinction is she had a stricture initially as her presentation with penetrating disease, but now has this long post-op course. And I agree with Russ that in a way you could argue she's done exceptionally well. She's probably exceeded the expectations that I would have. I think if we were to see her today, and I'll, I'll talk about this in my uh, lecture, She's 19, she was young when she first had this. Her disease, even though the stricture was there and she had penetrated in disease, probably happened pretty quickly and you could argue this is a high risk for recurrence. However, fast forward what? So 20, 25 years and she's done well. I would probably tell her if she truly has no CTE, small bowel follow through evidence of Crohn's, that if she starts to get partial small bowel obstructive symptoms, this is a beautiful case where you can do a balloon dilation to open up that stricture and look in the ileum. It may be that if I had scoped her and I wasn't sure and seen that bland stricture, I may have actually done a balloon dilation just right then and there, try to look in the ileum because you couldn't pass the scope. And if she's truly otherwise an I zero, meaning that she doesn't have any disease above that, I would tell her she's very lucky, very fortunate, and leave her alone. Now, if you tell me that she has progressive disease, active inflammation, she's had one surgery, then mesalamine alone is not effective. And I would argue probably metronidazole at this point is not preventing recurrence because years have gone by. And we probably would step up to a more uh, advanced therapy. But I agree with Russ. If she's feeling well now and she just has this narrowing, whether you balloon dilate that or not at this point, I'd probably follow her. You could get a fecal calprotectin also. Um, you may have said you got that and I missed it. Her CRP's up a little bit. She's slightly iron deficient, but again, I don't know if that's from her Crohn's. Uh, it's not uncommon to see some of our patients, especially female patients, if she's menstruating, iron deficient anyway. So I would probably step back, have a shared decision discussion with her decide how aggressive we want to be at trying to look at her ileum, um, maybe get a fecal calprotectin, and if that's very high, that may be effective uh, as well as the next step. So do you find the fecal calprotectin helpful for small bowel disease? I know Dr. Cohen was saying that he, he didn't find it as helpful, but you know, in, in, with the lack of biomarkers that we have um, and the fact that we can't endoscopically evaluate what's really happening in the rest of the ileum, is that something that you find valuable? Yeah, so, so I think the, um, the answer in post-op Crohn's is probably yes, but it's different than this case. So um, the POKER study, uh, which was a study that looked at managing post-op Crohn's by following endoscopically, they also checked fecal calprotectins. If you pair, and this is true anytime I use a fecal calprotectin with anything, if you pair a colonoscopic exam with a fecal calprotectin and they pair showing that there's inflammation on both, colonoscopy shows inflammation, fecal calprotectin is high. And when we say high, uh, ideally over 250, like it's not a, a gray area, this is truly high. 
that's a patient that I find a fecal calprotectin that's helpful. The problem right now is years have gone by. If you get a fecal calprotectin and it's in that 80 to 100 range, you're not really sure what to do. Probably that wouldn't be something I get too excited about, but if it is something where it's in the thousands, several hundreds, that may be a patient where I would step back and say, you know, maybe there's something more going on or CRP is a little bit up. Um, but that's different than post-op prevention in measuring fecal calprotectin, which may have a role on when you scope the patient. If three months after surgery, it's starting to get above 150, that's probably going to prompt us to an earlier scope. So she's in a different category right now. All right, great. So, um, Dr. Limke Kai, what would you, would you consider endoscopically dilating this, or would you leave this alone? I mean, how or all of you, how would <laughs> would you leave it alone? Yeah, well, she uh, does have some constipation, right? So we don't know if that's related. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, fortunately, she's feeling well right now. And with regards to constipation, you said she had a Bristol stool scale about three to four. And oftentimes, the type of stool, the consistency of stool, as it actually enters into the right side of the colon, is liquid. And it's over the course of it actually traversing the entirety of the colon that it actually starts to solidify. So in this particular case, I'm not sure how much uh, the constipation is really reflective of this obstruction per se. And at the same time, she didn't really mention much of any like bloating or any like postprandial symptoms. So from the standpoint, if we were to be guided by symptoms by itself, I, I'm not sure whether endoscopic balloon dilation would absolutely be necessary. On the other hand, you know, I think that there is also still a role for that in terms of helping kind of open it up. It seems like this is something that's been there since 2003. It's relatively stable. You open it up and hopefully at least buy her a lot more time before the next before her ever even potentially developing symptoms down the road. But I do agree very much with what was previously said about the importance of the treat to target, making sure that uh, it's under control and her high risk actually for you know, developing uh, aggravated symptoms and uh, complications. We're, we're fortunately in the standpoint right now where in hindsight we have a lot of, she has done well, uh, but if we were to rewind time to back when, before she was lost to follow-up, it would have been very important to actually, you know, watch her closely and, and treat her accordingly moving forward. I, I have a quick question. So let's say this is someone we did want to dilate. Maybe she was having more obstructive symptoms. What would be your technique that you use to dilate these? Yeah, no, certainly. I would th say that, you know, the through the scope balloon dilatation, uh, dilation would be uh, reasonable if... Uh, if it's a short segment stricture, and I think that this is, you know, an anastomotic stricture, so we would presume that it's actually, you know, less than five centimeters. So uh, I would say we could start off with a balloon dilation. Uh, there's also the, you know, the strictureplasty that could be done, you know, with a electro incision uh, done by at certain specialized <laughs> centers with, uh, you know, advanced endoscopists. So how long do you keep your balloon inf inflated? Do you pro go progressively up in size? Yeah. Do, you do a multi multi balloon CRE. I, I, yeah, I, I typically go up in size progressively, and uh, you know, I, what I usually do is I start in with uh, what I estimate to be a, the diameter to which I could increase it, and then I, I insert it, and depending on the pressure that I feel as, as I tug it, push and tug, as well as what the uh, tech feels, uh, we can then decide whether we've reached a point of maximal compression, I mean, expansion, and or, you know, do we actually have time or space to be able to increase the uh, the balloon size or uh, diameter, and um, if it's you know sufficiently compressed or or tight, then you know give it approximately 30 to 60 seconds, more so on leading on the 60 second side, uh, hold it there uh, in the middle of the balloon, and allow it time to hopefully uh, achieve a little bit of mucosal tear, deflate the balloon, and if we see some bleeding, then that's a reflection of you know the tear having occurred, and if the if fortunately, in, in, in the ideal scenario, you'd then be able to pass the scope through that uh, narrowed segment. Yeah, so this is what the patient, we, what happened, well, I, I didn't do the case, but this patient had the balloon dilation. And it, um, she did have an area of ulceration proximal to the anastomosis. So the thought was that she actually did have some active disease at that area. And that wasn't seen, you know, on the uh, on the colonic side. But once the dilation was set, it was a circumferential ulceration. Um, after that short segment, though, the rest of the ileum actually looks pretty good. So there's a few aptus erosions, but the distal ileum actually looks good. So, what do you make of that? Is is that like a Ruckert's I four in your opinion, or not really? 
I don't, yeah. Yeah, so, so technically, yes. However, um, this is a patient, again, I think we would have a shared decision approach. I mean, you cannot argue with time and you cannot argue with the fact that she has done so well. So probably uh, I would have done exactly what you've done. Uh, my balloon technique is, as I think Russ was alluding to, and I agree with the way you, you would do the balloon. Um, first of all, if you can see on the other side and get a keyhole look and it looks like it's truly anastomotic, I feel much more comfortable doing a balloon dilation. If you're not sure or there's a very long stricture, that's when we get into some problems with whether we do it. But once you get through and see ulceration, by definition, she's an I-4. However, she's somebody that I would argue, I'd probably have a discussion with, you can go one of two ways at this point. You've done extremely well. You have really no symptoms. And I agree, I'm not sure the constipation is from this. Um, and you could make one argument to say, if you are accepting of the fact that you may need a laparoscopic revision with a short uh, uh, resection and a new primary anastomosis, I would leave you alone, I wouldn't do anything. And you may be this way for another 20 years and not have a problem. If you say, I wanna do everything I can to potentially prevent that, knowing that we may still not be successful, even if we added an advanced therapy at this point because the damage is already done, there's already probably transmural stricturing disease, and we may or may not be successful in treating this back to resolution. But if that were the case, then I would say, let's go ahead with some advanced therapy and we can get into what that would be. I tend to be honest, I'd be on the side of leaving her alone, having a discussion about another surgery at some point, uh, unless their symptoms were missing. I would also really, really push her on her symptoms. Some of our patients have learned to live with this. So if she tells you she's basically eating pureed foods, but I feel great, that's different than somebody who's really feeling well, eating more or less what they want, going about their life. So make sure to push them on their symptoms, especially their diet in these cases where you see this stricture, where you're wondering if she has more symptoms than she's admitting to. Yeah, so she's just, she would always say she's bloated and needs metronidazole. She says she needs, she has, it's all SIBO. So that is a very frequent symptom for her. Um, so at that time, she was thought to have a Ruckert's I-4. And, and so if that was the case, at, you know, you discussed your thought process and the discussion, the shared dis decision making. So let's say she wants to do everything possible to prevent any extra disease. Do, do you think there's a role for medical therapy here or not really? I mean, I'd be curious to hear what the yeah. others say. I mean, I think uh, you could. However, I wouldn't be shocked with well, no matter what medical therapy you agree to go on that when you go back in a year or two that she has the same <laughs> narrowing yeah. and ulceration there too. Sometimes that part is just kind of chronically there and we don't know if there's also a little bit of, you know, vascular tree of ischemia, not true of ischemia, but those strictures that form right at the anastomosis, I mean, if they've stayed there for so long, um, yeah, so. so she ended up starting on adalimumab induction. She wanted medical therapy, and she had the colonoscopy six months later, treat to target, let's see what happened. No change, you're exactly right. So everything's still the same, still has that ulcerated area. You see a little ulcer, actually better picture, um, where that there is an ulcer in that uh, anastomotic site. So, you know, at this point, she's concerned <laughs> that, that this is still there, and she's now feeling that a lot of her symptoms are correlated to, to this. So, um, yeah, so, there, there is, so in terms of therapies, the questions are, this is a long-standing stricture. We've talked about this already. There is ulceration within that stricture site. I think we've discussed that the medical therapy may not necessarily be the right step for this patient. Do you think there's any role in optimizing medical therapy to make this better? Yeah, I agree with Russ, I, and I say this to my patients all the time, and, and maybe I'm sounding more and more as a surgeon as I work more and more with surgeons, that probably the damage is so far gone that no medical treatment's gonna reverse this. We talk about in all of our trials, the earliest treatment is the best treatment at preventing progression. The progression has occurred. Um, could you, again, this is where you have a discussion with her and say, I would tell her I think there's high unlikely that this is ever gonna improve with any medication, whatever it may be. 
currently. Um, Florian Reeder, who works with me, is looking at some antifibrotic therapies, but that's not available today. So I would tell her that um, I think she's headed towards surgery, and if she's having more symptoms, I'd keep her on the adalibumab post-op. I don't think it's a failure. If she says, I absolutely positively don't want surgery, and there's no emergent indication right now, sure, you could check levels of the adalibumab, try to drive it to at least 10. Probably this is a patient you'd want higher levels, whether you reinduce and put her on weekly or put her on weekly. Do I think that's gonna make a difference in the long term? The answer is no. And I would tell her, I think you're probably headed to surgery. It's just whether or not you wanna give one last try or not. Um, but I also don't think adalibumab's failed. I think this is a disease that's progressed far beyond any treatment working. And personally, I'd be comfortable using adalibumab as my post-op prevention. Okay, so Dr. Kwan, from the surgical perspective, she's mildly symptomatic and she's, she has the constipation. We're thinking and we're telling her that the medical therapy isn't quite effective. It's not gonna quite work. What do you advise her uh, from a surgical perspective? Do you say, go for the, sur like, let's do it now? Or do you, how do you advise her in this situation? She's kind of in the middle here. You know, it's all, the cases that are slam dunk are the ones where they're super symptomatic or, or not, but she's in the middle. Yeah, I mean, I'd be curious if there's any imaging abnormalities to suggest proximal dilation. Um, I'd probe her a lot more on her symptoms. Um, but ultimately, even if there's no small bowel obstruction or partial small bowel obstruction with these findings, I think it's reasonable to do surgery as, again, shared decision making. Um, there, there are definitely risks from surgery. Uh, the rate of an anastomotic leak is actually uh, consistently shown to be 5% in multiple retrospective studies. So it's, we, it, despite our advances with minimally invasive techniques and perioperative optimization, it's still an issue. So <clears throat> those uh, discussions are much more uh, important in, in the case of patients with mild symptoms. Okay. The, actually, the only other thing I want to talk about timing of surgery, absolutely agree. If there's proximal dilation, if she's getting true small bowel obstructions, she's going to need surgery. I have a patient almost exactly like this who does a lot of international travel and lives abroad for long periods of time and is not entirely sure of the health care of where she is in the other country. She's actually electing to go through almost exactly this case, a surgery now because she's so scared that she's going to be away somewhere get an obstruction, need medical care. So it's almost a preventative effect. So that's where, again, you really have to come to terms with the patient. If she feels well, though, and has no symptoms or minimal symptoms, you could argue leave her alone, knowing that she could still progress to surgery. Yeah, okay, so she elected to actually have a resection. Um, excuse me. And um, at that time, they showed 15 centimeters of a neoterminal ileum thickening, and um, you know she had severe activity at that area. So now we'll move on to kind of what we do postoperatively in this patient. So what are the different options for her postoperative management? Uh, you know she's had a long period of time without really that many symptoms. I mean, almost 30 years, and here she is now. She does have a resection. It's almost an elective resection, um, but she did have that severe presentation when she was younger. So what options do you present to her now for postoperative management? You, you already chose. Mm -hmm. You would keep her on the adalimumab. She didn't fail adalimumab. She needs surgery. So keep her on the adalimumab. I mean, presuming you had good levels, and then scope her in six months. Great. It's not coming back. Yep, so that's what she did. She went back on adalimumab um, within one month of surgery. Is that timing important, Dr. Ruggiero? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the prevention of disease, obviously she's somebody that you've treated her disease too late, not you, but her disease went by, so you wanna to try to avoid that. I think one, within one month is realistic based on what we have. Usually what I do with our surgeons at Cleveland is patient gets surgery, they get discharged from the hospital. By two weeks, the surgeon's telling us how the patient's doing, make sure there's no leak to the point of a complication. And if there's not, the earlier the better. I mean, if you're gonna use it as a true prevention. But I think by one month is very real, reasonable and realistic. So she has her colonoscopy six months later. It looks pretty good. Although the reports do suggest that she had an anastomotic ulceration. So I guess the question I have for the, for the panel 
the significance of anastomotic ulceration. So I know that there's a lot of questions, is this an ischemic, is this a surgical issue, or is it, a, uh, is it possibly a suggestion of early Crohn's? Where are, where, where do you, what do you guys think about that? We'll, we'll find out. <laughs> Either she'll ca keep on having the same when you look again with the scope, or it'll progress. Yeah. And if it's progressing, then I think you need to do something. But it's hard. I mean, people who don't have Crohn's who have surgical resections and anastomoses get ulceration out there anastomosis. Yeah, and I'm going to lecture a little bit on this. And we actually have a couple of um, oral presentations at DDW on the anastomosis. And there have been several publications already. And to Russ's point, I think one thing is clear. This is probably not true ischemia in the way we used to think. It probably is recurrent Crohn's. Um, we don't see this as much with just oncologic only surgeries. So unless you see a true staple with an ulcer at the staple, that's different. But most of the anastomotic changes are Crohn's. What you put up there is an I2A, I2B, just to very simply tell people what that is. Think of A as anastomosis. If you see five ulcerations or more lining the anastomosis, but above that and below it, in the colon and in the ileum is totally normal, that's I2A, that's confined to the anastomosis. And the punchline for something I'm gonna give in my talk is we think that's probably lower likelihood of progression, but I agree with Russ, we don't ignore the patient, we actually bring them back within a year for a colonoscopy. I2B, I2B before the anastomosis means it's at the anastomosis you see a ring of ulcerations, but then it extends into the ileum. I2B, that's the nomenclature we now use as a subset for the Rutgers. That would be something I would be a bit more aggressive in treating. I wouldn't ignore that. That's a true recurrence. And then when do you bring patients back after that initial six months post-op? Yeah, so I think if, if they're truly I0 and, and she had no ulcerations at the anastomosis and she was on adalibumab, my practice now has been to do a fecal, and uh, Russ and I can maybe debate this, but I usually will do a fecal calprotectin, especially if I already have it and I know it's either been high with inflammation or very low with no inflammation at about six months. At six months, if the fecal calprotectin is less than 150, ideally lower, then I wait a full year if they've had no disease. If it's like this patient with an I2A and she's on adalibumab and she's already had two surgeries, I may tend to bring her back at six months and look again. Final point is for those that are starting to do small bowel ultrasound, small bowel ultrasound may be a very unique way of looking at post-op recurrence, but maybe a little bit out of the spectrum of this discussion. Yep, so, okay, so we'll go on to the case. So about six months later, her CRP is actually low now, which is great, um, hemoglobin's fine. You know, discussed at some point um, adalimumab trough testing, but she was concerned about cost, didn't feel great, she didn't need it. Um, her constipation symptoms, huh, didn't, no surprise to anyone, it did not change after surgery. And she's found to have more dyssynergic defecation on anorectomanometry, and she was being scheduled for biofeedback. But about six months later or so, her hemoglobin's now dropping again, uh, hemoglobin 10, microcytic. Um, she receives an IV iron infusion, and her fecal calprotectin is elevated at 189. We don't have a baseline. Um, but, but it is higher than we would have probably expected. Um, she gets a scope around that time, so we bring her, she bring, she's brought back, and, and there is actually a lot more activity than she had uh, previously. Uh, so she does have circumferential ulcerations, uh, which is very surprising. This is a real case. <laughs> and, um, and she has, um, yeah, she has, I, what would you call this in terms of the recurrence? Uh, it was categorized as Rutgers I3 because it was more than five ulcerations, and there was some circumferential activity that was occurring here. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. If your question is what to score <laughs> this, I would say an I3. Yeah, so she was I3. So I, my question to you then is, you know, what is your approach when there's objective evidence now on a treatment regimen? She's on the adalimumab. Do you try to optimize her therapy, or do you move on to different mechanism of action? Did she fail the TNF therapies? What are your thoughts? Don't you wish she never did that second surgery? Yeah. <laughs> Does she, and I'm sorry, she does have a level of adalibumab? She doesn't yet. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's what you would do next to see, right? I'd, I'd probably check a level. I'd be a little worried that she's progressed this quickly, but I guess if her level's very low, or certainly if she has antibodies, 
um, that that's somebody that I would uh, switch her off the adalimumab. Um, I'd like to know what a level is, but I am getting a little bit worried about her. The, qu the question is, and this is maybe a little bit of a controversial point, is whether or not IV infliximab works after adalimumab better than the other way around. And, and I think it's interesting. We all still, I think, think infliximab, for whatever reason, I can't explain it, may have some different properties. But I think what you're getting at is if she's truly a failure of anti-TNF, you're going to switch her out of class, and I'd probably go to ustekinumab. Okay. So, you know, one of the things is that <clears throat> uh, if you're not someone who gets levels often, this is a patient you do want to get the levels because primarily you want to see why is that alimumab not working? And, do, and particularly, does she have anti drug antibodies? Because if she had anti drug antibodies and no adalimumab, that would suggest she didn't fail anti TNF therapy, she just happened to make antibodies. While if she had plenty of adalimumab, a really good level, and no antibodies, then you're like, well, she's clearly failing adalimumab, and maybe anti-TNF wouldn't be the way to go, as Miguel was saying. All right. So uh, we, she gets it, her <laughs> adalimumab is increased to weekly. She does have a trough level, more than adequate trough. Um, she's on azathioprine as well at the time, and and, uh, and and it's a low, you know, she has a low level, but she doesn't take it all the time. Uh, her calprotectin is a little bit better. Uh, she ends up getting a colonoscopy again, but this time there's actually quite a lot of progression. So she has a lot of friability at the distal ileum. Uh, the anastomosis is involved. There's a lot of edema. And um, yeah, so at this point, she's more of a, an I-4. So given that evidence of disease progression on the weekly adalimumab um, with the combination of a, a low dose of azathioprine, um, would you consider this? A, we kind of touched upon this a little bit. Um, is this a mechanistic failure of all anti-TNF? I think Dr. Ruggiero mentioned he would consider switching over to ustekinumab. Um, Dr. Lemkakai, are there, what are your thoughts on this and any other diagnostics you consider for this patient? Yeah, no, so we're, um, so the, um, if, if she didn't actually have such severe disease, then, you know, uh, and if we were to think about staying on the anti-TNF mechanism, uh, I think part of the thoughts or part of the studies that actually had prompted the, um, the impression that infliximab is superior to adalimumab were some of the network meta-analyses that show that, you know, infliximab versus uh, when compared with adalimumab or even when either or are compared with placebo was had a higher effect, uh, effect size um, for achieving either uh, induction of clinical response and remission. Now, if our underlying thesis is that anti-TNFs are still effective, uh, it would be effective in her case, and perhaps infleximab would be another option. However, you know, given the progression of a disease, even with you know what seems to be high levels on the adalimumab earlier without antibodies, as well as you know with quite a severe disease, I would actually also agree that we probably would switch out of the anti-TNFs. Okay. All right. So I'm going to talk a little bit about positioning of therapies in Crohn's disease. So Dr. Limka Kai did touch upon network meta-analyses, and I'm just going to touch briefly upon this because I think it's important. So the way that we best assess positioning of therapies is, what, is by looking at head-to-head -head comparisons and prospective studies, but those are expensive, and it's impossible to do a head-to-head -head trial for every single combination of therapies. So really, the best way we can assess this is by looking at our phase two and phase three studies and performing um, network meta-analyses to really determine which therapies may potentially have better um, clinical outcomes than the others over the long term. So Dr. Sit Singh at UCSD has performed network meta-analysis looking at uh, positioning therapies in Crohn's disease for the induction of clinical remission. And then for bio-naive patients looking at 15 randomized controlled trials, the suggested first-line therapies with the highest odds of uh, having clinical remission were with combination therapy of infliximab and a uh, azathioprine and adalimumab. Um, there have been one head-to-head -head trial looking at um, Crohn's disease patients with bio-naive moderate to severe Crohn's, and this is the CVU trial that was presented at DDW last year. And basically, they looked in this prospective study, um, the com uh, outcomes in ustekinumab versus adalimumab, and, and the outcome of clinical remission at week 52. And here, interestingly, you can see that the outcomes are um, pretty similar in the two. They had very high remission rates, actually, in both groups, and the thought could be that the baseline disease activity may have been a little bit low on both groups, but you know, there was no key differences in primary or secondary endpoints, so I think ustekinumab is a reasonable option for bio-naive moderate to severe Crohn's disease patients as well. So what if patients have already been exposed to previous uh, biologics? So with this network meta-analysis, they suggested that second-line therapy after previous biologic exposure be optimal with adalimumab 
and rizinkizumab. So let's talk a little bit about rizinkizumab because this may be in our armamentarium very soon. So what is rizinkizumab? So um, we know about ustekinumab, which is a P40 uh, subunit blocker, so it blocks IL-12 and IL-23. Rizinkizumab focuses just on IL-23 by blocking the P19 subunit. And so what we found, um, and, and what's been found in the phase three induction studies is that both the 600 milligram and 1200 milligram dose were able to meet the co-primary endpoints of clinical remission an endoscopic response um, in both bio-naive and in bio-experienced patients. Um, so I think the 600 milligram dose IV for induction is being considered by the FDA right now. And then for phase three maintenance, the Fortify study um, at week 52, um, this uh, 360 milligram sub-Q dose every eight weeks is being considered right now as it met co-primary endpoints of endoscopic response and clinical remission. I just wanted to make sure you were aware of this drug because it may be in our armamentarium very soon. Okay, so we're going to go back to this patient, the study, uh, I mean, to the, to the case. So she gets an MRE done because she does have a lot of progression, and we wanted to understand whether there was um, any transmural complications associated with the activity. And she has 10 centimeters of ileal narrowing, no dilation of the ileum upstream, no fistula or abscesses noted. Okay, so we tried something a little different. So we did try infliximab with azathioprine first, but we did talk about ustekinumab. She had already been on azathioprine, and we, and, uh, and we didn't want to lose that, um, at least her being on that. So she tried that first, um, but we also said if there was an improvement that we would switch her over to ustekinumab. So um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit and ask you if you are proponents of proactive drug monitoring. So she switches over to infliximab, and, um, and what are your thoughts on that? Like, are you pro, or do you, do you not do that? <laughs> so I'll, I'll tell you, in this case, I, pro, I would be proactive. So I would do a post-induction week 10. Um, unlike severe ulcerative colitis, where I may even do it earlier, but that's for different reasons. Um, I would do a week 10. Ideally, I'd like to see it well above 15. Uh, and At uh, week 10? Yep. OK. Mm -hmm. Yep. So okay. I guess that's what I would do. You know, one of the things, though, is she had really good levels of adalimumab, and she's on combination therapy. So unlike someone who has inexplicably low levels of the TNF, where you're like, what, is their body eliminating it? In this case, I would be less likely to do an early level because it wasn't, I mean, the, the adalimumab was, being in, it was in her body. It wasn't mm -hmm. like she was disappearing in the stool or wherever the heck it disappears to. And she's on combo therapy, so the likelihood or likelihood of her having a subtherapeutic infliximab level, especially being on azathioprine, would be pretty low. Yeah. Okay. So, um, how often do you consider combination therapy with anti-TNFs with infliximab? Um, Is that something that you're doing all the time? Sometimes? Are we going to debate this? Yeah, you will. Yeah. But just one sec. You know, don't don't talk too I much. I don't want to let him know yes, my no. secret. <laughs> well, I want to hear what Russ says first. <laughs> He's taking notes all of a sudden. <laughs> Okay, we'll wait for the debate, but I, I'm curious. Dr. Limkikai, what do you do for combinations? Do you consider that for anti-TNF therapy or I'm not? actually eager to hear the debate. <laughs> <laughs> not sure yet, okay. Um, all right, um, if you do consider combination therapy, so in a patient like this, do you continue the thiopurine indefinitely or do you have a goal of stopping this in the future? Where are you on that? Wait to the debate. Oh, that's also gonna be discussed in the debate, okay. All right, so interestingly, her colonoscopy actually looks pretty good. I'm surprised. So this yeah, is although where... although again, that's why I said what I said about it. What's <laughs> map after adalimumab? And and I don't want to be uh, pixie dust and magic when I say this, but I think we've all seen this where whatever for whatever reason, one of the three other anti TNFs has great levels. The patient's not responding. We switch within class to infliximab, and in my one positioning slide when I give this talk, this is the one exception where if you have good levels of drug to one of the three other anti-TNFs, I will sometimes still use the IV infliximab, where the other way around I do not do. So if you said that infliximab was the first therapy and she had a level of 24 infliximab, zero um, antibodies, I would not switch to an injectable anti-TNF. I would have switched her out of class, but I think this is a great example. Yeah, I, I've been puzzled by this. I've seen this a couple times, so that's why I do try it before I completely give up on the TNF mechanism. And um, and you know, I, as far as ustekinumab as a second 
you know, after someone has had an anti-TNF failure, have you seen that successfully reverse the inflammation um, in patients that have had significant inflammation on the So s simply, my answer is yes. Um, I have seen used to kidney map work and primary failures of anti-TNF. Okay. There was a dedicated trial when yep. Usakinumab went for Crohn's approval. They had a dedicated trial on infliximab, well, anti-TNF failures, mostly infliximab uh, failures, uh, too. So now, that's, that's why we suggested uh, right away that if you were to change mechanisms in a TNF failure with good levels in Crohn's disease, it would be leaning towards Usakinumab and, and uh, possibly Rizinkizumab, probably Rizinkizumab when it becomes available. Got it. So now this is good, it's better, but it's not perfect. She didn't achieve mucosal healing. So she does have Ruckyard's I2 disease here, actually. It, you can't see it all, but she has Ruckyard's I2. So in someone like this where you get improvement, but you're not completely there. So this is the going to your treat to target question, Dr. Rick Cohen. Right. Can, what if we don't get to perfection? You know, we know that our drugs aren't perfect. So uh, you know, when do we decide that, that this is good enough? Well, I think there's different clinic, there's clinical settings. Uh, she's already on azathioprine, she's not taking it. So you could argue that maybe if she was taking it, it would get better. Um, you know, the, the Rookert scale is really to predict what would happen after surgery. But once, they, once what's happened happened, we really don't have any validation that the Rookert scale means anything anymore. Um, so I'm not disagreeing with, with saying, well, she has the ulceration. She's, she's clearly better. Um, you could check a level if you haven't, mm -hmm. and maybe optimize infliximab. Um, but um, you also would, would consider having her on the combination therapy so she doesn't make antibodies and, and ruin a good thing. And this is a patient you would consider combination therapy for? Would this have, I know we have the debate coming up. Well, you did in have, her, you in did her, have her, she wasn't taking it, but right, right. maybe that would be a good reason to in, 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 induce her to take it. Say, look, it's, it's working finally, but we got to we got to get you a little better. But, but one thing for the audience I think is important, and Jenny, you're, you're kind of bringing this up, and, and we say this all the time now in our IBD conferences about treat to target, don't let perfect be the enemy of good, meaning right. what you showed us, those deep ulcerations are now gone. Um, this is a significant improvement, and even if it's an I2, she's gone from I4 to I2, that's incredible. I agree with Russ, this may be somebody that I would optimize within infliximab. You show a level of 14. Um, I don't know if that's after, at week 10. But this is somebody you could argue, maybe you push the infliximab a little bit more, but she's on the right track. The other thing is sometimes when we look early at six months, there is still a delay and the patient will continue to improve. So this is a trajectory and the trajectory is favorable enough that I would definitely not switch her off infliximab at this point. Okay, great. Yep, so this is my question, whether we are good enough, we stop here, and I believe that's the case here. And right, so we're again addressing that question. So let's say she has these biomarkers that also remain elevated in her case. Um, is that, do you think that that's a predictor? Would you escalate her therapy in that setting? Like let's say her, you know, her trough level's at 14, her calprotectin still coming back, it's at 200 or 180. Yeah. Berkeley, what are you doing? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, we also do know that calprotectins can be elevated even in the absence of Crohn's disease. And, you know, uh, even like constipation, for instance, and other GI disorders have been found to uh, produce an elevation in calprotectin. If we suspect that the calprotectin is, let's say, uh, it tracks with the level of inflammation or ulceration that we had seen endoscopically, then we can say, Okay, what is our goal in uh, trying to achieve mucosal healing? If, you know, what we had mentioned earlier, you know, let perfect not be the enemy of the good. If we are somewhat satisfied with, uh, some, with some degree of mucosal activity, at least in the meantime, then we treat it accordingly, or we, you know, treat or we manage it accordingly. But on the other hand, if we've had, you know, good mucosal healing and biomarkers remain elevated and after, you know, all the you know, thorough or pan endoscopies do not find any evidence of active inflammation, then it's hard to say because, I mean, you know, we've all encountered patients where the calprotectin may still be elevated even in the absence of disease. Um, I will uh, nonetheless add and also or emphasize what, you know, Dr. Rogero had mentioned earlier about the trajectory being important. And, you know, uh, and in addition to that, I'll also add that, you know, sometimes the, the use of these medications, while helpful for, um, inducing remission, we do know that, you know, the amount of immunosuppression required for induction versus maintenance of remission 
is actually at different levels. So the question here is, you know, can we actually use an adjunctive agent or something to really help this infliximab along? I mean, maybe some sort of topical steroid or some sort of, you know, um, other agent to just, you know, nudge this a little bit more if, again, if we are uh, trying to aim for uh, complete mucosal healing. Well, why did you, why did you send a calprotectin if you weren't going to act on the results? Well, the question is, it's treat to target. I mean, no, but so that's I mean, my point. <laughs> like, just what's like the with point? the old days of H. pylori, the question, and people say, oh, someone's H. pylori came up positive, I'd treat them. It's like the question wasn't whether you should treat, the question is whether you should test. You already committed yourself, you checked to calprotectin, it's still very elevated, she, not thousands, she has active inflammation, better. Than, so you've already kind of gone to the path where you're saying, well, you know, um, we have a few different markers. Remember my lecture? I know it was a long time ago, where they're not normal. Um, and she's had kind of a remarkably rapid recurrence uh, after her surgery, yeah. which I'm sure you're kicking yourself. Although I would argue what, what, Jenny, what Jenny did, though, with the CRP now normal, and Russ, to your point, the fecal calprotectin has trended down. It's just not perfectly normal. It's still in a range that I'd be very comfortable with. So I agree with Jenny. I think it's heading in the right direction. Her CRP is better, even though it's elevated. Don't let perfect be the enemy of good with the fecal calprotectin either, especially in somebody with surgery. That's why in the, the poker study, that 150, 250 range was probably what we were seeing. If it was in the thousands, that's helpful. And I, I would do exactly what you did, Jenny. I think yeah. that's a very reasonable approach. So yeah, that's where I think treat to target is important and we do, but I do think sometimes we get a lot of information back and you know, sometimes it's hard to know how to process all that information, what to do with it. And um, I'm not saying that it's a, a problem, but it is something we have to figure out how to recognize and, and work so with. So then you're going to repeat a fecal calprotectin to see if it keeps on trending down mm -hmm. in three months? Mm -hmm. Three months, three months, six months, uh, three months. But I think? think also that even if the next fecal calprotectin, say, comes back in that 150 range and the next colonoscopy shows I2, I1, the, this is for the audience to do not switch her off of infliximab oh. because you're going to start burning through our advanced therapies. And these are the patients we see too many times. Um, unless she's had a true mechanistic failure of infliximab, I would keep her on the same therapy. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So that's going to be the end of that first case. Um, so our take on points, anastomotic ulcers may be a sign of early disease activity. Early post-op prophylaxis for high-risk patients with close monitoring and medical management can potentially help prevent the need for repeat surgery in the future. And if there are any discrepancies between biomarkers and symptoms, that mucosal disease activity is probably your gold standard and important to assess um, if there's any evidence of progression. So with that, um, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Dr. Ruggiero, and he's going to give his talk on what's new in post-operative prophylaxis in Crohn's disease. Great. Well, thank you, uh, Jenny. And, and actually, this was a perfect setup for my lecture because I think we covered about 90% of what <laughs> I was going to say. Um, but I'd still like to spend a few minutes with you talking about the story of postoperative Crohn's disease. And just to remind people, you've probably seen this multiple times, um, but this is the natural course of post-op Crohn's. So imagine, if you will, where the red arrow is. In Jenny's case, this would be 1992 for the patient. They undergo an ileocecal resection with a primary anastomosis. For that split second, assuming that there's no Crohn's disease anywhere else in the gastrointestinal tract, it used to be, we say, surgically cured. We got away from the word cure because we know this isn't a cure. But interestingly, start looking to the right. There have been studies actually biopsying, and I'm not suggesting a one-week colonoscopy, by the way, but biopsying the neoterminal ileum one week after surgery and actually finding already there's histologic disease. Look further to the right, by one year, we know that there's endoscopic disease. Now, the endoscopic disease may be mild, but we see the disease come back. What happens over time, and this is, I think, Jenny's case that she presents, those endoscopic disease turns to scarring, turns to tissue destruction, damage, symptoms, and then once the patient has symptoms, usually the cat's out of the bag and it's too late, and about half the patients need surgery again. Look at the very top of the slide in the yellow arrow where it says clinically silent. 
you can take and make the patient who has severe Crohn's, especially with a stricture, feel the best they ever have by just simply taking out the disease portion. How many times in your clinic do you see a patient who comes back a month later and tells you, this is the best I feel after surgery? Now, in Jenny's case, by the way, we didn't get to this. I have a feeling the patient probably had constipation, predominant irritable bowel on top of Crohn's disease, but in many of your patients, they feel great. The worrisome part of this, and this is a study we have going on at Cleveland Clinic, is much of the disease recurrence is clinically silent until it gets to the point where there's damage. And that's a similar model to what you see in a newly diagnosed Crohn's for the first time in your clinics anyway. Meaning how many times do you do a colonoscopy on a patient, very first time, forget post-op, you're making the diagnosis of Crohn's and you say, this looks terrible. And the patient said, but I've only really been symptomatic for two months. This is the same thing in post-op Crohn's. It takes a while until the damage is far enough that the patient actually has symptoms. Well, Jenny did a nice job of already giving a preview on the endoscopic recurrence, but I'd just like to simply uh, tell you what the scoring is. And by the way, I agree with Russ that a lot of times we don't have the scores built in our system, but I do think it behooves us to do so. I'm not plugging probation when I say this, but we use probation, and we have the Rutgert score, the Mayo score for ulcerative colitis, and the SESCD score, and it's very easy to use because you just click down box and actually it will generate the score for you. And it's actually something I think we probably should use uniformly because we all will then speak the same language. But post-op Crohn's, Paul Rutgerts in 1990 described, what do you see in the neoterminal ileum with 10, within 10 centimeters of the anastomosis? That's how the score is derived. Zero normal, one less than five ulcers. If it's a two, more than five ulcers, three, more diffusely inflamed, or four, complication of stricture and ulceration, that also then predicts who is more likely to have recurrent symptoms and another surgery. So what are the two approaches to post-op Crohn's? Jenny did a great job of outlining this in the case. One is to prophylactically start, and probably if we were to do that, we should do two to four weeks after surgery, or do we wait? Do we not start? But unlike 20 years ago, when we were starting to understand post-op Crohn's, where we just said, goodbye, good luck, come back when you have a symptom, the problem is within five years, 50% of patients were coming back not only with a symptom, but a complication that required surgery. So if no therapy is done, uh, and I think Russ mentioned this on the panel, this is where at six months we're usually doing a colonoscopy to look. If we decide to start a post-op treatment, the question is which one? And I'll just derive two general options. One are microbiome altering agents, and you could put diet in there, interestingly, although the diet studies haven't panned out for post-op Crohn's yet, or an advanced therapy like a biologic therapy. There are lots of other studies that have been done. I'm not gonna go through all of those, but budesonide, thiopurines, probiotics, none of them have been effective. And five ASAs have not shown efficacy in preventing post-op Crohn's disease. This is actually out of University of Chicago, uh, Russ's site, where actually low-dose metronidazole, so not high-dose, low-dose metronidazole, 250 milligrams three times a day, actually did show a benefit at preventing post-op Crohn's. So low-dose metronidazole are the dark bars versus control are those patients who did not get low-dose metronidazole. On the left-hand side are the bars showing endoscopic recurrence lower with low-dose metronidazole. On the right-hand side is an I0 on metronidazole. The only problem I have personally in my own practice with metronidazole is if metronidazole is to work, you need to continue it. Once you give it and stop it, then the clock restarts. So it doesn't mean the patient forever is not going to have Crohn's. You haven't cured Crohn's by three months of metronidazole, but you've altered the microbiome, which is what we think is probably happening. So the, and the other part of this is even at the lower doses, a lot of patients don't tolerate metronidazole. So what's the other option for early treatment? And by the way, I should say there are a number of microbiome altering medicines that are now in, in phases of studies. In full disclosure, I'm starting to help plan with some of the companies around this. They're not commercially available yet, but I do wonder if that's gonna be a post-op management.
What about anti-TNFs? We spent a lot of time talking about anti-TNFs in post-op Crohn's. This is the only so far randomized controlled studies we have. This was a study that I did in 2009, which actually we randomized a small number of patients. So this was just a proof of concept study. This was not meant to be a pivotal study where half the patients got placebo infusions and half the patients got infliximab within one month of surgery. And at one year, we did a colonoscopy and said, do they have endoscopic recurrence or not? It's a pretty simple study. What we found were placebo in red, yellow is infliximab, a striking difference. Now, one else, all other caveat for this, these were extremely high risk for recurrence patients. So these are patients with their second, third surgery, smokers, penetrating disease. And I think the reason we saw such a dramatic difference where these were patients that were at the highest risk patients for post-op recurrence. However, that proof of concept study led to a larger study called the PREVENT study, which I was honored to be the principal investigator. It was an international study. Some of you in the room may have been involved in this, where we randomized to infliximab or placebo, and again, we followed them long-term. However, one caveat, remember in the small study we did, we used endoscopic recurrence. In the international study, because at the time J&J &J, uh, or Senecor was actually going for an FDA label change, the FDA mandated that clinical symptoms, clinical symptoms were the primary endpoint. I remember sitting in the FDA regulatory meeting saying, this is going to be a failed study. It's not going to meet the primary endpoint. Why? You take a patient who has Crohn's disease, you put them through surgery, regardless of what you do for the first year, clinically, most of the patients feel great. So it's hard to see a difference. Well, what did we find? We didn't find a clinical difference between the treatment and placebo. So in this, just focus on the left-hand side. This primary endpoint of clinical symptoms, blue is placebo clinical recurrence, and gray is infliximab clinical recurrence. Now you can look at the p-value. If you squint real hard, it's 0.097. So it didn't meet the 0.05, but it wasn't too far away. I think there are two important points here. Look at placebo 20%. Only about 20% of patients had symptoms one year later after surgery. That's kind of what we see anyway. Do nothing after surgery, the patients feel great. So whether they're on treatment or not, they feel okay. However, the other part of this is you do start to see a bit of a trend towards infliximab being lower, but it did not meet statistical significance. This is why there's not an FDA-labeled indication for infliximab in post-op Crohn's. What about the secondary endpoint, which is really what we wanted as the primary endpoint. That's what we're kind of used to, right, in our post-op studies. Is there disease endoscopically or not after a period of time? Well, this is where we did see a difference. Again, blue, look at the left side, blue placebo and gray is infliximab, and you can see there was a statistical difference between the two. Here's a take-home point I would make. What we found in all of the post-op anti-TNF studies that have been done to date, it's about 20 to 22% recurrence at one year. So if you have a patient sitting in your office, naive to biologic therapy, and you wanna put them on an anti-TNF, I wouldn't tell them there's 0% at a year. I tell them it's about 20%, 20 to 22%. And, that's, and it's, it's unbelievable you see that number across multiple trials. So I think that's actually real. It's not just the one trial we've seen that. So that means 80% do not have endoscopic recurrence. We're doing nothing, which would be placebo, about half the patients have an endoscopic recurrence uh, at a year. What about other medicines? So these are some newer data, um, vedolizumab and ustekinumab. One thing I'll say, and it's in italics up front, is a limitation is that there are currently no prospective studies on this. There is a European study on vedolizumab, but we don't have the report out yet uh, as far as whether that works. So the best we have are some retrospective analyses and vedolizumab versus anti-TNF. Vito's in blue, anti-TNF's in yellow. And you can see that there's really no difference between the two. However, endoscopically, you do see a statistical difference with anti-TNF. Again, a caveat, this was not a prospective randomized uh, study. So I'm a little hesitant to say that vedolizumab does not work 
but at least in this analysis, vetalizumab didn't perform as well as an anti-TNF. Do I use vetalizumab for post-op Crohn's? Absolutely yes. Do I use this first line? No, but many of our patients have already been on an anti-TNF and Jenny presented may have failed an anti-TNF. I think Vito is very reasonable. The other caveat was there was originally some early information, Amy Leitner, who's with us now in Cleveland, that Vito may actually complicate post-op Crohn's. We have not seen that. So yes, you can use Vito preoperatively, postoperatively. There's no complication with post-op Crohn's. What about ustekinumab? This is a study looking at ustekinumab versus azathioprine. So again, a bit different of a study. Azathioprine is in purple, if you can see the bars. Yellow is ustekinumab. On top right, which is probably what I would look at, is endoscopic recurrence. And again, you can see ustekinumab performed better. Again, it's around that 28% recurrence. So it kind of makes sense. I think the days of using azathioprine or 6-MP post-op are gone. We haven't shown enough data that it prevents endoscopic recurrence. So you're probably all still sitting there going, when is the best time to start post-op treatment? Should we start it right away? So right after surgery, kind of where you see the small red arrow, not wait. I would, and I'll argue at the end, I think in our high-risk patients, that's probably the best place to start it. However, if we could predict the tipping point, meaning the point by which the patient has inflammation, but it's not irreversible damage, it'd be reasonable to wait. The problem is we don't know precisely when that time comes, and if we wait too long, patient gets symptoms, they have damage. Jenny's case is a good uh, description of that. Patient sometimes needs another surgery. And like I said, if it's too late, it's irreversible. I'm um, just a brief comment. Our group, uh, we have a lot of surgeons. You could throw a rock and hit a surgeon at Cleveland Clinic. I make that joke all the time, but it is true. Um, and we're looking at different anastomosis, and I'll be curious to hear what our surgical colleague uh, thinks about this. But there's a Kono S, which is a different anti mesenteric functional end to end. And then there's uh, uh, Dr. Coffey in Ireland at the bottom looked at actually an extensive mesenteric resection, which is kind of interesting because the mesentery is an immune organ. And the mesentery itself may actually be a proponent and a reason for post-op recurrence. So Stefan Holobar at uh, Cleveland Clinic is now combining both of these surgeries, the Kono S with a wider uh, anti-mesenteric uh, resection. And again, maybe there's some data there. What's the Kono S? Well, there was a Supreme study. Again, I know most of you in the room are probably not surgeons. Those that are in the room that are surgeons already have seen this. But it was an interesting study where this new approach, uh, Professor Kono is the one who invented this surgery. And what does this look like? This is from Stefan Hullabar, Cleveland Clinic, who, who gave me these uh, slides. So you can see where the little hash marks are, the resection of the cecum on the left and the terminal ileum on the right. And then the con OS is essentially you're making an end-to-end -end anastomosis. However, there's this support column that's created. So they're sewing off of the end-to-end -end anastomosis. And then there's an opening of the actual ileum and a separate anastomosis, that Kono S approach, where you have a support column at the bottom and an end-to-end -end anastomosis. So the question is, does this make a difference? And interestingly, in this study, this wasn't using medications, this was just using surgery to prevent post-op recurrence. If you just look at the top left, the six months uh, post-op recurrence, and this are Rutgert scores, you can see the Kono S is in the dark bars, and the non kono s patients are in the gray bars, that kind of almost looks like infliximab. So it's interesting, just based on the surgery alone, there was a prevention of post-op Crohn's. I still think it's too early of a day to say that using a certain surgical technique is the answer at preventing post-op Crohn's, but this is intriguing data. So I'm just going to wrap it up and tell you that after all the years and some of the new studies, and we have a, a bunch of new presentations at DDW, and some of these are under embargo, so I can't present them, but hopefully you'll come to DDW and hear even more uh, data coming on our post-op. What do we do with post-op Crohn's? This is my approach. Now, I've made two small exceptions, and you already heard this on the panel, I think, from many of us. How do I approach anastomotic ulcerations? And the other is I don't use monotherapy, azathioprine or 6-MP, 
probably for most of my patients. I wouldn't say there are zero IBD patients I have on six MPAs of thiopurin alone, but in post-op, I'm not using that as much. Jenny did a great job at already talking about this, and this probably is one that we just still scratch our heads over and wonder, what do we do? You get to the anastomosis, you see this ring of anastomotic ulcerations. This is not ischemia alone. This is Crohn's, but the question is, what's the score? So we talked about this already, and this is just the modified Rutgert score. I2A, A anastomosis, I2A, ulcerations along the anastomosis. I2B, ulcerations along the anastomosis and extending into the ileum. And then the question is, does that matter? So A, anastomosis, B, before anastomosis. So does it matter? Well, it's confusing. So like anything in IBD, we have half our studies show one thing, half the other, and you're left there going, well, what do I do? Um, so on the left-hand side, there's some studies showing that actually, no, it doesn't make a difference. On the right-hand side, it says, yes, it does. This is probably the one study, this was published in 2020. I think this is the best we have so far, and, and we will present our data, larger data at DDW this year, which shows the same thing as this, which is simply this. I2A alone probably has a low risk for progression, but it doesn't mean we should ignore it. I think Russ said this and I agree with him. Probably six months after seeing I2A, we probably should do another scope just to make sure it's not progressing. What happens to an I2A anastomotic ulceration? I think this probably is what happened with Jenny's case back in 1992. Maybe they didn't look, but over time, these are patients who get a stricture right at the anastomosis and they respond extremely well to a balloon dilation. So this is just really my, my last algorithm slide before I get into the summary. This is how I approach post-op Crohn's, and I break it into two categories, low risk for recurrence after surgery and high risk for recurrence after surgery. The low risk for recurrence after surgery is the patient who comes to you for their very first surgery for non-penetrating complication, and they have about a 10 to 15 centimeter area where you do the resection. Maybe that's a patient we don't need to treat with medicines, but you have not cured them from their Crohn's. It's just whether or not they have rapid recurrence. I, in my practice, do a fecal calprotectin at three months, and I do a colonoscopy at six months. So if you're not going to treat them, uh, we should definitely make sure we look early. And if they have recurrence, we need to treat them. Don't ignore that because that's a patient, Jenny showed you what happened when they progress. Most of our patients still fall into the high risk for occurrence. You're seeing them, they're on their second or more surgery. That's the highest risk factor we have that's panned out against all of our studies. Or these are patients with penetrating disease. I do think anti-TNF monotherapy is reasonable with proactive levels, but you could also use an azathioprine 6 MP. If they've been on an anti-TNF, I think ustekinumab, vedolizumab is very reasonable. So I think the future is, is bright with post-op Crohn's. There's a lot of study. I'm not gonna go through all the studies. This is just from our group in Cleveland, the way we're breaking out uh, post-op Crohn's and some of the microbiome and some of what we think. So these are just the take-home points, uh, and then I'll end. Post-op recurrence is common. Penetrating disease and recurrent surgery is the highest risk factor. I didn't mention smoking but our patients need to quit smoking after surgery. Anti-TNF is the current best treatment. However, many of our patients have been on an anti-TNF, so Vito and Eustachinimab is reasonable. Stay tuned for small bowel ultrasound. I think that's reasonable. And a six-month colonoscopy, in my opinion, should be done in all of our post-op Crohn's patients to look for early recurrence. So thank you very much. Okay, that was great. It was a wonderful summary of everything that we talked about during the case. And so what I'd like to do for the next few minutes is answer some questions and uh, some questions that you guys submitted. If you have any further questions, please feel free to submit them and then we'll, we'll address them over the next 10 minutes. Uh, so I, I actually really like this question because I was going to ask this to the uh, panelists. Um, someone asked if our presented case, um, do you question whether surgical resection was the right approach to begin with? So this is right, I think even during the case, Dr. Cohen's whispering and saying, oh, this is what you get for resecting. And is this, is this something that may have activated her 
underlies, uh, underlying quiescent IBD. Because um, her, act, her activity, this is a real case, really became quite aggressive after the, after the resection, after having so many years of doing well. Yeah, you know, I mean, generally we do resections for people who have pain, blockage, can't cut off steroids, uh, growth failure, um, uh, or even watching on the imaging well, she's going to have a disaster if you don't do the resection too. Occasionally, though, Miguel mentioned a patient who was going to be traveling extensively who looked like they were kind of on the cusp of needing surgery. And, and the other thing to remember is if you have a patient who's planning a pregnancy, it's idea that ideally you do a workup, uh, you, re you check things before their pregnancy. So uh, I have sent patients who maybe haven't completed obstructed yet for a elective resection prior to them becoming pregnant because you don't want them to have a bowel obstruction during their pregnancy. But um, yes, I, I kept on nudging you every time you show me <laughs> things are getting worse. I'm like, sure, left her alone. Yeah, and, and the only thing I'll add is we, we don't know. We don't think there's true pathogy based on surgery, meaning that you do a resection, so like pyodermic gets worse if you start to incise it. We don't think that's the case. Honestly, in this case, Jenny, I think this is a patient who did well for a number of years. Now the question we don't know is why did she start to have active disease even before the surgery? My sense is was she was progressing. Is there something environmental that changed, something that happened that we just don't understand the disease? I think it's the disease itself. I don't think the surgery brought it out. We hear time and time again from our patients, I don't want surgery because it's Pandora's box. It's gonna open up all these problems. I, I'm not sure that's, that we can say that yet. Right, and I guess in retrospect, having seen how this case played out, would you have left her alone? <laughs> so I pro well, yeah, it's hard to- Monday, put it back Monday, in? Is that what you're asking? Put it Monday, back. Monday morning quarterback. <laughs> I, I, pro I pray, it's a hard question to yeah, answer. I probably would have left her alone, but I would have had that heart to heart with her. Um, but it's not wrong to go to surgery. I have a, I told you, I have a patient exactly like this who just went through surgery because she lives in a foreign country most of the year and she really wanted to, and she's done very well, so time will tell with her. And virtually all the time we see patients sent to surgery too late, not too early. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just stunning. Don't use up every medicine known to mankind. Patient needs surgery, okay? We're not, we're not surgeons. We're telling you the patient needs surgery. They have good levels and they're failing, you go to surgery. Don't send them too late with a perforation. Now they have an ostomy, they wouldn't have had it beforehand. Plan things out nutritionally. Where are they in, in life? Are they about to get pregnant? Are they finishing school and now they have this semester between now and they start their first job? Um, there's so many things with Crohn's uh, patients that you really have to take into consideration um, about planning things, and ideally, if they're gonna need surgery, it's a, a semi-elective one with a great surgeon, with the equipment, with the team they want, uh, and not something that's done uh, suddenly. And, and Dr. Kwan, when you get these uh, referrals, do you like to have them in advance, like someone who's not really too symptomatic, you know, somebody who's not at the cusp of needing surgery, do you like to get those kind of cases come to talk to you ahead of time, or do you find them a nuisance? What do you feel about that? Um, I, I do. I, I think there are probably depends on where you where what your practice setting is. Um, if you're referring a patient to a surgeon, but there's not that close communication with the surgeon, it can be confusing for the patient if they don't really understand why they're in your office. It can be scary for them. So. I think in a multidisciplinary setting, there's no question it's better to see them earlier. Yeah. Okay. I'd good. like to add actually something. The, this case is actually very interesting in a sense that it illustrates how we really don't have a crystal ball for the future because we do see that if we were, we would have acted differently prospectively as we, if we were to have all this hindsight and um, see what had actually occurred after the case. So. You know, I mean, similar to when we actually decide about whether we're going to start biologic therapy or not, or whether we're going to actually pursue surgical intervention or not, a lot of it's also best, based on best guess estimates of probabilities or likelihoods of success. Um, and so I think that this was actually a very interesting case from the standpoint of, you know, how the, don't let the outcome of a, or a potentially adverse outcome suddenly color, you know, your entire practice, because, you know, at the same time, we still have to realize that sometimes there are also outliers. Yeah, so what's interesting to me is that with treat to target, these questions will come up more because we are trying to be more proactive and prevent 
bad outcomes. But you know, the question is, what you know, again, is are, would they be better if they were left alone? And, and that's what we don't know. Um, but I think it's important that we at least acknowledge that um, you know that these these issues can come up now that we're being more proactive with understanding how they're doing throughout the course of their, their treatments, right? So um, I, there is a question that came up that I think is interesting. Um, would you ever consider Stellara in older patients with post-op Crohn's? So even biologic Mr. naive. Kinemap. Yeah, oh, sorry, excuse me, <laughs> Mr. Kinemap. Um, so even biologic naive, given fewer side effects, um, would you ever reach for that first? So it's, it's interesting, we actually have a publication on this and the abstract's already out. The publication I think has been accepted or we're in the final revisions where we actually um, have enough patients who received Ducekinumab first line and we looked at over 65 years of age um, and the safety profile was excellent. So to specifically answer your question about Ducekinumab, yes. Um, we have less data specific to post-op Crohn's in a patient over the age of 65, so I can't answer that, but I would have no hesitation in using Eustachinumab uh, for post-op Crohn's in somebody over the age of 65. However, in the United States, you have to know what insurance your patient has when you are selecting therapies. So older patients, presumably on Medicare, Medicare does not cover the injections of Stellara. It used to. We were able, through the American College of Gastroenterology and other groups, we were able to prolong the coverage during the pandemic, but that is over. So infusables are paid for by Medicare, injectables are not. That has we've been had, a, we've a had some patients we've infused eustachinumab as their primary treatment, but that gets tricky. Yeah, no, I think we're all dealing with this issue. It's, it's unfortunate because it's a very safe medication and is something that we would like to reach for in our elderly population. So I'm hoping there can be some change around this policy at some it, point. Yeah. It, it won't be changed. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, so um, there's some questions um, about just management in general. So in this patient, uh, they asked, someone asked, why not use infliximab as first-line therapy? Um, so this patient had adalimumab as the first-line therapy for, um, for that stricture that she, she had. Um, what are your thoughts on that in terms of, would, that would have been a, an option as well? Sure. I mean, she had had previous surgery years ago in penetration. She decided to go with adalimumab, but that was an excellent option. Infliximab would be an excellent option. I mean, there's, yeah. sometimes it depends upon, I mean, many of us, we, all, we hate to say this, but many of us quote unquote save infliximab. <laughs> um, don't give it first because as you saw in this case, sometimes it's, 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 uh, it, it, it's the best thing you might have in an in individual. Um, so infusions, there are, immunogenicity issues, things too. So many of us won't give infliximab first line uh, unless someone is very, very sick, maybe severe colitis or hospitalized, things like that too. Um, but I yeah, and, and I don't, I don't think it's wrong. I don't, I agree with Russ. I don't think there was anything wrong with adalimumab. If again, we don't have, and we probably never will have a head-to-head -head infliximab versus adalimumab for primary treatment of active Crohn's. Jenny, you already did a nice job of showing the network meta-analysis on bio-naive patients, and adalibumab and infliximab were both listed as a reasonable first-line therapy. So I, I don't think that, that there's any problem with that. The other, in post-op prevention, there hasn't been a prospective randomized controlled trial with adalibumab. However, there was a Spanish study where they looked at retrospectively, and they didn't see a difference between adalibumab and infliximab at even preventing post-op Crohn's. So I think, it's, I think it's reasonable. I think it also depends on the patient. They want to come in for infusions. As Russ said, are there insurance uh, issues? Biosimilars are now out. Sometimes you have to use a biosimilar infliximab first. Biosimilar adalibumab will be out. Um, so there's other factors, but I don't think that was wrong. Okay, um, and Dr. Limkakai, there was a question about checking um, 6-TGN levels when azathioprine or um, imuran is used in combination with uh, anti-TNF therapy. Do you routinely do that? 
Yeah, no, certainly. So um, I actually, you had asked a question earlier about proactive drug monitoring, and I'm kind of in the camp of actually doing proactive drug monitoring, and that also includes checking the thiopurine metabolites, you know, for those who are on azathioprine or 6 mercaptopurine, and, you know, the metabolites of interest are the 6-TGN as well as the 6-MMP, which is associated with hepatotoxicity if too high. Uh, so in these individuals, it also depends on, you know, what my goals are for the combination therapy. So uh, there are two kind of facets of how I actually use combination therapy. One is, you know, if I were to use it for both the efficacy as well as the prevention of immunogenicity. And there are also some patients in whom where I use a combination therapy primarily for prevention of immunogenicity. So if I were actually to do the first part where I was trying to actually achieve greater efficacy, you know, with that synergistic effect, in addition to the prevention of immunogenicity, that's where I would be more um, diligent about checking the therapy and metabolites. On the other hand, if um, I was more concerned or uh, uh, my primary motive for using combination therapy was prevention of immunogenicity, I would actually be uh, less diligent about that. Okay, great. Now, um, the, Dr. Kwan, there's a question about um, type of anastomosis uh, for Crohn's. What are your thoughts on the different anastomoses and, and what approach do you take with that? And, and the current new anastomoses that have been looked into, what are your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I mean, the Kono S has been featured at our meetings. Um, certainly hasn't um, caught on. I, I, think, I think a lot of surgeons look at those uh, diagrams and see basically a, a hand-sewn side-to-side anastomosis, which um, there have been maybe older studies on comparing stapled versus hand-sewn. Some of these studies show uh, higher leak rates with hand-sewn. Certainly in training, you're not doing as many hand-sewn. So I think widespread uptake of cone OS is, has some challenges. But we certainly need to see that data, particularly in the United States. Um, and uh, I, I'm more interested in the wide mesenteric resection. I think that's very intriguing. Um, we traditionally will take the bowel very close to the um, mesentery because it can be oozy and uh, bleeds a lot. And you know, if you go deeper in there and you get into bleeding, it's a little more difficult to control. So, um, but certainly can be done like we do in cancer operations to do a wide mesenteric resection. Again, if the data uh, points to that being a benefit. You know, um, uh, Dave Binion had uh, and his, and in the laboratory and in, and in now in real life had shown that perhaps an end-to-end -end anastomosis was the most physiological and would, would cut back on stasis um, and causing a lot of symptoms. He showed even cutting back on emergency room visits um, uh, and cost savings with that. Uh, and being an endoscopist, end-to-end -end anastomosis, we love those. It cut, cuts my colonoscopy time in half easily. Um, you know, it, it's just, I think when we do those, um, it's hard to know if you're going to end up with a stricture when you do an end-to-end -end hand sewn. Um, so the side-to-sides, we're using staplers that are six centimeters or eight centimeters long, um, and that gives us a level of comfort that you're not going to have a post-op stricture. And you're talking about the side-to-side -side functional end-to-end? -end. Yes. The ones that we hate because when we yep, do the scope. It's hard to so when you do the scope, what you see in front of you is not the lumen you want to be in. It's the dead end of the ilium. You have to find. You have to look back over your shoulder, up about 270 degrees up that way, and that's where the lumen is. If you don't, if you don't see bile and stuff coming down, you're in the dead end. <laughs> the dead end can have Crohn's ulcerations too, but you got to go back over your shoulder, look back up there, and you'll find it. It's brutal. It is. It's brutal. <laughs> I agree. Okay, last question. What do you look for in small bowel ultrasound? Are you doing small bowel ultrasound at your institutions in Chicago and in uh, Cleveland Clinic? Go ahead, Russ. Well, we just started. Okay. So Yeah, so did we. I, and there are courses in the United States now for those that are interested. I think you're going to hear more about it at TDW. I think the, the potential advantage is it's a point of care test that can be done by the gastroenterologist in the actual office. Uh, the downside is there's obviously technical expertise that comes with it. And Jenny, to your point, you're looking into thickening. There, there are different scores with it, but the Italians have done it, the Canadians have done quite a bit of it, and now it's starting to be used in the United States. And you also have to 
work with your radiologist because some of the radiologists are a little bit hesitant. They don't want to do it, but they also don't want us doing it. I'm just being realistic about some of the controversies you may hear if you start doing it. All right, great. So with that, I think we'll take a short break. Thank you so much for staying with us for the Crohn's disease portion. And, um, after the break, we'll talk about an ulcerative, ulcerative colitis case. Uh, so they uh, will be reconvening at 9.55 a.m. Mm -hmm.